But I do want to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. David O'Hara. Uh, he's going to come to talk to us about the topic of relativism. So Dr. O'Hara is Associate Professor of Classics and Philosophy at Augustana University in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He teaches ancient philosophy, American philosophy, environmental ethics, Asian philosophy, and philosophy of religion. He has taught classics in Greece, environmental ethics in Alaska, and tropical rainforest and reef ecology in Belize and Guatemala. A lover of languages and of travel, he has learned over a dozen ancient and modern languages. He's written books on fantasy literature, trout fishing, ecology, and philosophy. <clears throat> Dr. O'Hara is a graduate of Middlebury College with a BA in Spanish, uh, St. John's College with a Master's of Liberal Arts, uh, Penn State University with a Master's and a PhD. Uh, Dr. O'Hara is also a, a friend of mine from my time at Penn State. Uh, he's a delightful and amazingly humble person for as many things that he can do well. Uh, last year, he, he had an incident where he was uh, injured pretty badly in a, in a boat accident and uh, realized that he had forgotten Portuguese. So in order to recover, he learned, was it uh, Icelandic or ancient? Old Icelandic, oh, old Icelandic. yeah. Because uh, sure, why not? Um, <laughs> and then the Portuguese came back. So you know, <laughs> in the process of uh, recovering, he gained a language. And that's the kind of person he is. He's a learner, and uh, he's a, a lovely person to talk to. So I invited him here so that you could have a chance to meet him and to hear uh, some of the wisdom that he's uh, gained over the years. So let's uh, welcome to the podium Dr. David O'Hara. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Dr. Riley, and thank you to uh, the school and to uh, Roberta Israeloff and the Squire Family Foundation, and really to all of the teachers and to all of you for being here. Um, I will tell you, I woke up this morning uh, from a dream. The dream was that uh, you all had expected me to come here and to perform this talk as a song. Uh, and um, that was just the, one of the most terrifying dreams ever uh, because I'm not a singer. This is not going to be Hamilton. If you have tickets to that, leave now. Uh, you, you can maybe make it in time. I don't know if this is up here yet. Let's see. There we go. Um, this will not be anything like that at all. Uh, I feel a little bit sheepish offering a lecture on philosophy, being brought in as the 50 mile expert, somebody who lives more than 50 miles away, therefore must be an expert. Uh, I, I, because this school has amazing philosophy faculty already, and the fact is, if you're from one of the other schools visiting, you are also the recipients of a remarkable benefit of being able to, to study philosophy in high school. I didn't take my first philosophy class, let me correct myself, I didn't take my first half a philosophy class until I was a senior at Middlebury College. I got halfway through the semester and realized I had no idea what was going on in that class and I dropped it. And I didn't return to philosophy until uh, graduate school. Well, that's not quite true. My first philosophy class was probably my geometry class in middle school. Because in geometry class, they made us demonstrate what we believed. And they made us distinguish between what we could show to be true and what we had to assume to be true in order to continue arguing. I just didn't realize that I was studying philosophy at the time. And in college, I had a history professor and a, several literature professors who did the same sort of thing for me. History, uh, history professor who showed me that if you read lots of different versions of the same story in history, you will often see the gaps in the stories. And you'll start to see not only the gaps in the stories, but you'll see how it is that history itself is shaped. This is an introduction to the philosophy of history. Anyway, this seems to me to be a good time for us to be talking about relativism because, uh, as some of you may have figured out, we had an election this week and uh, it left uh, a lot of people confused what just happened. Um, I think it also leaves a lot of us feeling, uh, not the, so much the election, but the debates, uh, leave, a, leave us feeling like, well, that's just a bunch of people shouting opinions at each other. Is there any possibility of ever arriving at any kind of agreement if people just have strong opinions and the people who are deemed to be the winners are the ones who shout the loudest or who have the most art in the way that they speak. Anyway, that's what I want to talk about. Um, the way that I want to talk, if you go to a philosophy conference, you'll often find that people have a 
sheaf of papers and they will read from them. I do have a sheaf of papers. I'm not intending to read from them. I'm going to use them as notes and sort of uh, narrate my way through this rather than, uh, than lecture to you simply. Um, what I want to do as well is actually something that uh, Israelov spoke of, and that is to try to connect several disciplines. So I'll be talking not only about philosophy uh, and quoting from some philosophers that you may have heard of, some that you probably haven't heard of, but also from some literature, uh, some of which I think you will have heard of. In short, what I want to do today, I want to define relativism. I want to show how certain forms of relativism are self-defeating. I want to show you how there are some other beliefs that resemble relativism that actually have what I consider to be a virtuous basis, and then offer you an approach with some of this literature uh, to some books and some thinkers that can help us to cultivate the very best elements in relativism while avoiding its pitfalls. So that being said, let's talk about relativism. <laughs> what is relativism? Now, there are, this is one of those times when you might be tempted to say, well, here's a definition on the board or on the screen. I'll write it down, and, and, and that'll be on the exam, and there you go. No, this is my definition. There are, another, there are a number of other ways that you could define relativism, but work with me here. Relativism, as I'm understanding it today, is the claim that there's no objectively correct belief. That is to say that there's no belief that is correct and correct outside of my opinion. So if it were just my opinion, we would say it was subjectively correct. But the, the, the relativist claim is that there's no belief that's correct outside of my opinion. Another way of putting this would be to say that, that the, the value of a belief is relative to the perspective of the person who holds that belief. And so this is why we call it relativism. Here's three common forms of relativism. We can think of epistemic or sometimes aletheic from the Greek word aletheia, truth. Epistemic relativism from uh, epistemic, uh, from episteme, knowledge. So the epistemic relativist will say that there is no truth. That truth is a matter of, of it's, it's a word that we use to, to describe strongly held opinions, but it's not the case that there is some objective truth out there that we can discover. <coughs> Related to it is moral relativism. That's the claim that there is no objective standard of goodness or of moral value or of ethical judgment. So this is, I say it's related because this is the claim that there is no moral truth. <coughs> and then sometimes we see aesthetic relativism. So this is uh, summed up in this idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, there's a hint of it in Keats's um, uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn in the last few lines of it where he says, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all that you need to know. Um, so aesthetic relativism would claim that there is no such thing as objective beauty. And you can see in the ice cream cones that we run into a little bit of each of these. There are some things that we would say that we're more inclined to believe are true, that this ice cream cone is, is pink and this one is white. Uh, there are some things that we would say we are far less inclined to believe objectively true. This one tastes good, this one doesn't taste good. That would say is a matter of opinion. Now, it seems to me that there's a very strong weakness in all three of the forms of relativism that I've put up on the board, or up on the screen so far. I've just exposed myself as somebody who uses a lot of chalk in a classroom because I keep talking about the board. Let me expose myself just a little bit further as, uh, as, a, as somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, I sometimes begin my classes at, the, at Augustana this way by saying, if you have come here under the impression that I'm somebody who knows what he's doing, let me disabuse you of that right now. Um, yes, Dr. Riley's right. I have spent a lot of time reading books in my life. The more I read, the more I realize how little I know. And one of the great things about being in a place like this is not that I get to stand up here as some sort of expert who knows all things about relativism, but that I get to present to you some of the thinking that I've been doing and that you get to correct me or show me gaps in my thinking errors in my thinking. So the, I think the part I'm most looking forward to is the conversation that happens after this. Anyway, as I see it, I think there are some weaknesses in these three simple forms of relativism that I just showed you in the epistemic, uh, the moral and aesthetic relativism. And they're exposed by asking a few simple questions. If somebody says, there is no such thing as truth, my response to that is, is that true? Now you can see that this is not a very interesting conversation, but it can be at least a helpful way to advance the conversation by showing that there has been a logical error committed. 
if, I, if somebody says, yes, it's true that there's no such thing as truth, they've just shown that they're making no sense and I don't have to listen to them anymore. If, on the other hand, they say, no, it's not true that there's no such thing as, tr as truth, then they've just said something that's false and I don't need to listen to them. Either way, I don't need to listen to them. The person who says there's no such thing as truth is very often simply trying to shut down the conversation by saying something that sounds profound, but that really isn't. Similarly with moral relativism, it's not quite as strong, but th there's a similar question that can be asked, and that is, is it morally good to believe that there's no moral goodness? To put this differently, does it benefit us as a community to stop striving for working out what's best? Does it benefit us to stop trying to live a good life together? And of course, you could ask the same kind of question about aesthetic relativism, although I think that one is probably the weakest. If you say, is it lovely to believe that there is no such thing as the truly lovely? Is it beautiful to believe that? We can come back to that one, but it's, the, it's these first two that I especially want to focus on. So why is there relativism? If it's so easy to defeat epistemic relativism and moral relativism, why is it that it's still so attractive to us? Well, one reason that's attractive to us, I've already said, if you can say something that uh, is strongly relativist, you know you can win arguments by simply being loud or by seeming to be profound. But I think that there's a better case to be made. Ruth Benedict uh, wrote a book about a century ago called Patterns of Culture. She actually wrote several books worth reading. Uh, in this, she points out that uh, through her anthropological studies, looking at a bunch of different cultures, that there are lots of different values. You go from one culture to another, you see different notions of what it means to be married, different notions of what it means to be committed to a friend, different notions of patriotism, and so on. If there's pluralism, this suggests that there is no unity, and that no one culture's values should be allowed to dominate another culture's values. No one culture should be allowed to look with disdain upon other cultures. I think that this is actually something that is based in a virtuous point of view. I won't agree with Ruth Benedict entirely in this, because if, for instance, somebody says, our culture says that it's okay to create concentration camps and then to kill people who we don't like, or our culture says it's okay to kill innocent people or to harm innocent people, I will respond to that not by saying, well, that's your culture and I'd hate to look down on it with disdain. I will respond to that by saying, I disagree with you and I think that you are morally wrong. I'll probably go further and say that I think you've, create, you've committed some logical fallacies. This is one you can feel free to ask me about later. I think that very often racism is based on a logical fallacy. But could it be the case that, that relativism is nevertheless virtuous? I think so. Because I think that what Ruth Benedict was pointing to, even though that there, there's a gap in what she says, I think she's pointing to the importance of being patient with other people and being charitable towards other people. I think she's pointing to being honest in our assessment of other people's views and diligent in assessing our own knowledge. It is very tempting to present ourselves as people who know more than we know. Uh, it, probably some of you have, maybe all of you, have read Plato at some point. And you may remember in, uh, in Plato's uh, dialogue, actually in his, uh, his, the Apology of Socrates, Socrates is asked, well, He's, one of his friends asks the oracle at Delphi, is Socrates the wisest? And the oracle, speaking in typical oracular fashion, says, no one is wiser. Which does not mean, of course, that Socrates is the wisest. It could be that he's equally wise with everyone else, in which case, no one is wiser, no one is less wise. But some people interpret that. They misunderstand that, and they interpret that to, to mean that Socrates is the wisest. And Socrates, later on in the Apology, says, well, if I'm wise, my wisdom consists in this, that I don't claim to know what I don't know. In other words, Socrates isn't saying, I have a lot of knowledge and therefore you should listen to me. Uh, there's a great Dilbert cartoon from years ago where one of the, the characters says, I have a PhD, therefore I'm, I'm right and you have to listen to me. That also is a logical fallacy. I have a PhD and I know that I'm often wrong. So I, now the question is whether you have to listen to me when I say that. Well, you decide on that one. But I think that what Ruth Benedict and, and many others are pointing to is that we should be patient, we should be charitable, we should be honest, and we should be diligent. Let me give you some examples uh, of some people talking about this. Jonathan Lear is a professor 
and the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called Radical Hope, which is, a, a Radical Hope was about, basically about ethical despair in the Crow Nation. The Crow Nation being the Native American, uh, one of the Native American nations uh, that's at the western edge of South Dakota, where I live now, uh, and in the eastern edge of Wyoming. When we basically destroyed the foundations of ethical decision making in the Crow Nation, uh, there were some who said that that was essentially the end of history for them. And what Lear was trying to do was to go back and see if, that, if there was any reason for hope. And he saw in some of the Crow elders that they did think that they had reason for hope. There's a, a line that he says early on in the book that has stuck with me, and it's this. The interpretation thus fits what philosophers call the principle of humanity, that we should try to interpret others as saying something true, guided by our own sense of what's true and of what they could reasonably believe. It's a very simple thing, but it's an extremely difficult thing. Think back to how you voted or would have voted this past week. Most of us, I think, in this country felt fairly strongly about the election. Imagine thinking about the person that you were voting against, not the one you were voting for, but the one you were voting against. Could you imagine putting a good construction on what they believe? Could you imagine trying to interpret them as saying something true, where you're guided by your own sense of what's true and of what they could reasonably believe? This is really hard to do. And the difficulty of doing this, I think, is one of the reasons why we sometimes fall into relativism, into one of the weaker forms of relativism, simply because this is hard work. Some of the problems that we face in a math class uh, are hard, but they're solvable, and we can tell when we've solved them. Some of the problems that we face in a poetry class may not be solvable. It may be that the solution is the trying, and the trying with other people. Some of them, by the way, will be solvable, but some of them are going to be very difficult to solve and might take us a lifetime. Let me offer you another version of this. This is from Martin Luther. <laughs> Martin Luther's writing on the Eighth Commandment in the Decalogue, so the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bear, witness, uh, bear false witness against thy neighbor. What does this mean? Answer. We should fear and love God that we might, may not deceitfully belie, betray, slander, or defame our neighbor, but defend him, think and speak well of him, and put the best construction on everything. Now, if you know anything about Martin Luther, you know that Martin Luther was a guy who screwed up a lot uh, and who did not always put the best construction on other people. It didn't put the best construction on the Jews living in Germany in his time, on the capitalists living in Germany, in Germany on the, in, at his time, on Catholics and on peasants. He messed up an awful lot. Nevertheless, he articulates an ideal here that in many other instances he tried to live out, that we should put the best construction on what other people believe. Let me put this to you slightly differently, and I'll, I'll put a sort of a business edge on this that might help you. If you can get to the point where you can explain somebody else's position in terms that are so clear that they thank you for finding words that they couldn't find, you'll probably earn their trust. If you can do this in a sales position, if you can talk about the product that your competitor sells in such clear terms, that the competitor would, would be grateful to hear those terms spoken, then the person that you're selling to will very likely be more likely to listen to you. Now, I don't want to offer you just an instrumentalist view of truth. That is to say, I don't want to just show you how you can use what looks like truth in order to sell things. But this has an, a, a practical upshot when you're talking to people with whom you disagree. If you are a Republican speaking to a Democrat or a Democrat speaking to a Republican, if you're an atheist speaking to a religious person or vice versa, et cetera, et cetera, if you're, if you're speaking to somebody who appears to be on the opposite side of the fence from you and you can explain their position in terms that are so clear, so lucid, that they're grateful to hear their position described that way, you have now invited them into a conversation where they take you seriously and you've opened the door for you to now explain your position. You said, I take you seriously, I invite you to do the same with me as well. 
So does this mean that virtue, trying to be virtuous, demands that we be relativists? I don't think so, at least not in the weak sense of relativism. Let me offer you three different texts to consider. First, a passage from the philosopher Richard Rorty. Richard Rorty died just a few years ago. He also taught at the University of Chicago and a number of other places. Uh, Rorty was often decried as a relativist. His reason he explains, or the reason why he explains here, there is no truth. What could that mean? Why should anybody say it? Actually, almost nobody does say it. But philosophers like me are often said to say it. One can see why. For we've learned to be suspicious of the appearance-reality distinction. We think that there are many ways to talk about what's going on and that none of them gets closer to the way that things are in themselves than any other. We have no idea what in itself is supposed to mean in the phrase reality as it is in itself. He's hinting back to Kant, if you're familiar with Kant. So we suggest that the appearance-reality distinction be dropped in favor of a distinction between less useful and more useful ways of talking. But since most people think that truth is correspondence to the way reality really is, they think of us as decrying the existence of truth. Notice what, what Rorty's doing here. He's not saying, no, I don't believe in truth. What he's saying is, truth might be really hard to get at, and there will be times when we need to talk not just about some abstract truth, but we need to talk about the people who are right in front of us and how we are going to live together fruitfully with them. How am I going to help the people around me to flourish? And it may very well be that one of the things we'll need to do is to go engage in a very difficult discussion about how we find truth. Another text that you may be familiar with, many of you when you were children probably read The Little Prince. The Little Prince written by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Uh, he was a pilot. Uh, he wound up uh, dying in the Second World War when he was, uh, when he was uh, flying uh, for France. But he wrote a book called Night Flight, or Vol de Nuit, uh, which could be translated as Night Flight, or The Wish of the Night, or Theft in the Night. Vol de Nuit uh, is about the early days of airmail. This book is, it's a novella, and it's got sort of a, um, an existentialist feel to it. That is to say, in it, Saint-Exupéry is trying to examine what is the world like when we haven't got some kind of given moral foundation, when we find ourselves thrown into the world, and now we have to sort out what we're going to do. Now, the passage that I'm going to read to you, there's a man named Riviere who is in charge of getting the airmail to succeed across South America. At this time, trains can go all night long, but planes cannot because they don't yet have the kind of instruments that they'll need, and pilots are dying because they're flying in what seems to be a clear sky, then all of a sudden clouds come up and they crash, they just fly into the side of a mountain or fly out to sea and not realize it. One day, an engineer had remarked to Riviere as they were bending above a wounded man beside a bridge that was being erected, is the bridge worth the man's crushed face? Not one of the peasants using the road would ever have wished to mutilate his face so hideously just to save the extra walk to the next bridge. The welfare of the community, the engineer had continued, is just the sum of individual welfares and has no right to look beyond them. And yet, Riviere observed as on a subsequent occasion, even though human life may be the most precious thing on earth, we always behave as if there were something of higher value than human life. But what? Thinking of the lost airmen, Riviere felt his heart sink. All man's activity, even the building of a bridge, involves a toll of suffering, and he could no longer evade the issue. Under what authority? I'll have you notice that this passage does not answer any of the questions about relativism, but it raises some for us. It raises one in particular. We all seem to have the sense that there is something important in we all seem to have the sense that there are values, that there are things that we should strive for, that there are things that we should seek to know, things that we should seek to nurture and to protect. What are those things and how do we find them? One of the things that you can do is you can look to old books. I want to give you some examples from the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Uh, what I'm not going to do is give you a sermon on the Jewish and Christian scriptures, but I want to show you some really old texts 
where people were trying to grapple with the problem of truth, whether there is truth and how do we have access to it. And what I'll have you notice here is that we have prophets and we have apostles and others who are trying to figure out this question and others around them thought that that attempt to figure out the truth was so important that even though they didn't figure out the truth, the attempt should be written down. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. This is at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, some of this will ring true to you who are deep into the semester and you've got lots of exams and homework and so on. Not only was the teacher wise, but this part maybe not, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. Notice this, the, the words of the wise are like goads. You can look back to ancient scriptures. You can look back to poetry. You can look back to old texts. And you'll find that if a text has lasted for a long time, it's probably because it has continued to raise important questions or continued to speak to people, even if you don't agree with everything that the text says. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books there is no end, and here's the part that I think you'll relate to, and much study wearies the body. A couple more passages from the book of Job. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? If you know the book of Job, you know this is the story of a man who suffers and doesn't know why he suffers. And from what we can tell, there isn't a good reason. But he asks the questions, why am I suffering? And at the end of it, several of his very pious friends are given a talking to by God. They said things that sound very religious and very good, but they didn't care for the man in front of them. And God says to them, you have not spoken of me correctly as my servant Job has. And what has Job said? Job has asked a lot of questions, and he has prayed, and he's tried to figure out what the truth is, and hasn't succeeded. And this piece of wisdom literature, the book of Job, concludes saying, Job has spoken correctly of God, and the pious friends have not. I have this one in Latin, utinam disrumperis kailos et descenderis, I just happen to love the way that it sounds in Latin. But I, in I, the prophet Isaiah, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. This is a prophet. A prophet is somebody who's supposed to have some direct access to God. And here he is speaking to God and saying, I wish that the access were more direct. And of course, in John's Gospel, chapter 18, Pontius Pilate, when Jesus is right in front of him on trial and about to be put to death, he says, what is truth? These questions are important. They stick with us, and it's worth returning to them. So what, all, what does all this mean for us? Um, as I said, I want to open this up for questions shortly, but before that, I want to give you what I hope will be a couple of helpful guidelines as you continue this process of studying philosophy and this process of trying to sort out the truth. I'll give you a few words from Lessing, Plato, James, and Charles Peirce, and then conclude with something from Dr. King. From Lessing, don't mistake yourself for God. If God held all truth enclosed in his right hand and in his left hand, the one and only ever striving drive for truth, even with the corollary of erring forever and ever, and if he were to say to me, choose, I would humbly fall down at his left hand and say, Father, give. Pure truth is indeed only for you alone. When I say don't mistake yourself for God, what I mean is, if you find yourself at the place where you're no longer interested in seeking after the truth, watch out. It probably means you've come to the point where you've become very satisfied with what you know. Aristotle says there are three kinds of creatures and two of them don't ask questions. The gods don't ask questions because they already know the answers. The animals don't ask questions because they don't know the questions. And then there are humans. If you're not asking questions, is it because you think you're a god or because you are a beast? There's a really nice passage in Plato's dialogue, Mino, from which I will get this rule. Seeking truth opens you up to learning and to living well. Socrates in the Mino has been talking with a young man about geometry. 
and talking with another young man about virtue, and neither one of them is able to solve the problem that is put before them, and both of them are ready to give up. And Socrates says to them this, I do not insist that my argument is right in all other respects, but I would contend at all costs, in both word and deed, as far as I could, that we will be better people, braver and less idle, if we believe that one must search for the things one does not know, rather than if we believe that it is not possible to find out what we do not know, and that we must not look for it. Continuing to search makes us better, braver, less idle, even if we wind up not finding out the truth. A word from Charles Peirce, the American philosopher. Humbly open yourself up to refutation so that you can learn. Now he's responding to the Socrates we just saw, and he says, the real spirit of Socrates, who I hope would have been delighted to have been overcome in argument because he would have learned something by it, is in curious contrast to the naive, naive idea of the glossist for whom discussion would seem to have been simply a struggle. It really is the case that much study wearies the body. It really is the case that spending a lot of time even having to sit down and listen to a philosophy professor from the Midwest uh, can be tiring. Having to hold all of this in your head can be tiring. Trying to search after something that you can't find the answer to can be tiring. What Peirce is saying is, there is real delight in being proven wrong. Why? Because you learn something new. And a word from William James. Don't pretend to have the truth, lest the pretense keep you from seeking. James wrote, I do indeed disbelieve that we or any other mortal men can attain on a given day to absolutely incorrigible and, an, and unimprovable truth about such matters of fact as those with which religions deal. He wrote that about a century ago, so it doesn't sound exactly the way that we would say it, so let me put that in a paraphrase. James, this is from his Varieties of Religious Experience, is saying something like this. I don't think we'll ever figure God out completely. I don't think that we're the kinds of beings that can. I don't think we'll ever figure religion out completely. I don't think we're the kinds of beings that can. But he goes on to say, but I reject this dogmatic ideal, not out of a perverse delight in intellectual instability, it's not like I'm an agnostic because I'm really delighted in messing with other people's ideas. Rather, I am no lover of disorder and doubt as such, I, but rather do I fear to lose truth by this pretension to possess it already wholly. In other words, I'm afraid if I pretend that I've already got the truth, that will be the very thing that will prevent me from discovering the truth should it ever show up. Let me go back to the beginning just for a moment. Remember I said that there are these three very simple forms of relativism. Epistemic re relativism, the belief that there is no such thing as truth. It, the moral relativism, the belief that there can be no such thing as moral truth. And aesthetic relativism, the belief that there can be no such thing as uh, objective beauty, something that we can all agree upon. And I think that all three of those are weak. But I also think that there is some virtue that that can be expressed in something that resembles relativism, in trying to be tolerant of other people, trying to learn from other people, and trying to examine our own beliefs in order to see where they have gone wrong. Let me add just a little bit to that from Dr. King. I'll add, by the way, that all these bits in italics that are at the top, these are my, my words and not the words of these authors. I'm trying to boil things down a little bit. King writes, I have tried to make it clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or perhaps even more so, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. And in the same letter, this is his letter from Birmingham jail, I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent sanction of things as they are. What I want you to notice here is that King is making an appeal. He's making a moral appeal to something that he thinks everyone ought to see is true. An unjust law is no law at all. 
Many of you, I imagine, will go on to study law. When you study law, there are two different approaches that you can take to it. One is you're simply learning the rules so that you can game the system. Another is you're entering into a conversation with a community of inquiry that has attempted to enact justice, knowing full well that we will get it wrong, knowing full well that we need multiple chambers of a legislature because we have to debate it together, knowing full well that we'll need multiple branches within the executive branch, knowing full well that we will need a, a, a justice system that, that can allow for us to appeal the laws and, and that will attempt to interpret the laws as written by the legislature. If the Supreme Court's gonna do its work, the Supreme Court justices have to have some sense of what the right thing is. And notice that we don't have one justice. We have a multiplicity of justices. We need that because we need one another. Don't give up. Other people need you. Other people need you not just to learn a few tricks to sound profound and to game the system. Other people need you to study philosophy, to study justice, ethics, goodness, truth, beauty. Other people around you need you to use the gifts that you have to help them to flourish. Maybe just one more word. In Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons, the story of the life of Thomas More, More says this, God made the angels to show him splendor as he made animals for their innocence and plants for their simplicity. But man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. So I leave you with the invitation to serve the very best that you can imagine wittily in the tangles of your minds. Thank you. some questions and answers, so I'll bring the microphone around to you. If you uh, would like to ask a question to, of Dr. O'Hara, I can hand this to you and we'll pass it around. So who would like to get us started? Don't pretend you're all gods and beasts. There we go, good. <coughs> Just uh, stand and say it loudly. So uh, what do you base the moral fact that's a great question. What do you base the moral facts on? You can see with those three questions, or the, sorry, the three forms of relativism that I posed, the first one is the easiest to see the weakness in, and the last one is the hardest to see the weakness in. I think that the reason for that is that we probably all of us have something like a moral sense. If you think about the way that you go about reasoning, there's a a part of us that does our reasoning, you, we even talk about this bodily, sort of thinking with your head. You know, we tell people, get your head on straight or use your head, that kind of thing. There's also a time when it feels like we're doing our reasoning with something, our thinking, with something other than our reasoning. It's as though we are reasoning with our spirit, our reasoning with our heart. We get that heartfelt belief. And there are plenty of times when we just have a gut sense about something. We call it a gut sense about something. The reason I say this, that I've pointed out three different forms of relativism and three different portions of the heart of you that does inquiry, is to say, to say that I don't know. I don't know of a single source that's reliable for all moral facts. But what I do see is that we have the ability to solve certain kinds of problems, as I mentioned, Geometry was my first class in, in philosophy. And we also have, even within ourselves, a kind of community of inquiry. Think about whether or not you should go on a diet, whether or not you should exercise. There's gonna be some part of you that will say, yes, absolutely. You know, if I've spent my life eating nothing but pizza and donuts, I should probably start to eat some broccoli as well. 
I should, you know, if I've never done any exercise, I should probably start to exercise and take care of myself. But there's another part of you that's already been weighing in on this. I guess that's probably an unintended pun. Uh, there's another part of you that has been telling you, no, you should continue to eat the pizza and the, and the donuts. You should not exercise because it's no fun. I, this is why I think that we need multiple Supreme Court justices, why we need multiple uh, chambers in a legislature, and why we need to have conversations in philosophy classes. It's a great question, keep asking it, and keep pressing people like me who stand up and sound like they know what they're talking about. Other questions? So, yeah, so I think that there are some forms of relativism that boil down to either laziness or un uh, an unawareness of the logical error that we've just committed. Um, <coughs> as far as the logical error, that's fairly easy to correct. We can study reasoning, and there are a number of ways that we can do that. As I mentioned, studying mathematics is one way to study reasoning. Practicing science is another way. Studying poetry, drama, literature, scripture, there are a number of ways that we wind up studying reasoning. Uh, you think, uh, I, mean, I showed you some passages from scripture before. One of the most important parts of scripture for some of the great religious traditions is not the scripture itself, but what the community does with the scripture. Uh, if you write commentary on the scripture, if you gather together with others to study the scripture and to engage in that process of Midrash, this is this is one of the ways that we can overcome errors in reasoning. I know this will sound silly in the 21st century, but it's why I think everyone should study theology. Because theology is a very old discipline of people trying to study matters of ultimate concern. And every generation studies it a little bit differently. Every generation has something to add to it. Um, it's a great conversation to enter into. But I think there was a second part to your question, and that is that some of those questions, even when we have studied reasoning, it's very difficult to overcome those questions. There were a few students who sat in on a, uh, uh, who were in a class that I spoke to yesterday here at uh, uh, the school about wicked problems. If you are not yet, are any of you familiar with the idea of wicked problems? So it's a technical term, and it's one of those terms jot down or you know, Go ahead and, uh, and, and Google it. It's, a, it's an interesting class of problems. Problems, uh, there are problems like mathematical problems that might be very difficult, but that are solvable. And when you've solved them, you can see that you've solved them. You can, you can prove that you've solved them, or you can test the solution. Uh, same uh, with many problems in the sciences. But wicked problems are a class of problems where you don't get to make multiple attempts, because as soon as you've made one attempt at solving it, you've changed the situation in which the problem exists. Problems of um, dealing with global poverty, uh, with international development, uh, are often wicked problems. You could look at a problem like how do you solve the problem of global poverty? How do you solve the problem of getting health care to everyone who needs it? How do you solve the problem of getting food to everyone who needs it? And say, gosh, that's very difficult. I don't know how to do it. Many bright people have tried, therefore it can't be done. And I would say that at the, right at the point where you say, therefore it can't be done, you've committed an error in reasoning. But it's an honest error because it is a wicked problem. It is really hard. And so far, about the best that we've got for wicked problems is keep trying and include as many people in the solution as you can. So if you, uh, you look at one of these wicked problems, like the problem of global poverty, if we set a level of poverty, we said that if everyone had $5,000, everyone on planet $5,000, they would no longer qualify as poor. The, the wealthiest nations of the world can afford to give everyone $5,000. No problem, we can just print the money, we can hand it out. But you see, as soon as we've done that, we've created a new set of problems. So what we need is not just somebody who knows how to print money, but we need people who know what caused these problems and how do we anticipate the problems that we caused by whatever solution we give. This, again, is a great reason to study philosophy. A lot of the problems that you'll study in philosophy, uh, problems like the problem of free will, the existence of God, uh, the nature of justice, these are problems which I don't anticipate you will find a final solution to. You know, some complete answer to that problem that will 
answer the problem for forever. But by asking the question, reading the history of the, of the texts, and engaging in conversation with other people about them, you might advance it just a little bit further. Uh, there are certain problems that come with religion, and we have learned how to overcome some of those problems. Of course, we've generated some new ones as well, which means not that we should give up, but that we should keep working on it. It's a great question. Please. Um, obviously, our, uh, obviously, our focus today is on uh, moral relativism, but uh, I was, with respect to the aesthetic, um, what exactly would your argument against aesthetic relativism be? What acts, what uh, objective, what, what sort of level of objectivity do you think we can apply to that? And uh, sort of where are those axioms, uh, what are those axioms based on? That's a great question. Um, it's probably the case that we, uh, we don't strive for as much objectivity in aesthetic relativism because there's not a whole lot of money or power involved. And the places where it becomes most contentious is, are, are, the, are the places where there is a lot of money and power involved. But if you just look around this room, you can see that obviously aesthetics matters quite a lot. Uh, you know, look at these paintings up here. Just look at the architecture of this room. Uh, I will, can, I'll tell you uh, something I asked Dr. Riley this morning, uh, and you can tell me later, save, save me for right now, but you can tell me later if you think this tie and this shirt don't quite go together. I wasn't sure. Still don't know. Please spare my tender heart uh, if, if they don't. But you can see that we, I mean, you think about the ways that we dress ourselves, the ways that we do our hair, the cars that we choose. Aesthetics affects everything. And there are a lot of people who know this and who make use of this. So for instance, uh, people who design cars, people who design homes and other buildings uh, are already aware. People who write, uh, write commercials and who make advertisements are well aware that you and I are influenced by aesthetics and that there are aesthetic standards of some kind. I don't want to use that word too strongly, but some kind of aesthetic standards that shape us. We also know, though, that Ruth Benedict is right, that those aesthetic standards change over time and they change from culture to culture. Uh, so I don't have a strong case, uh, and, and I don't wish to make a strong case, that there is something like pure and absolute beauty, and I can show you just what it is. I've got a bit of it here in my pocket, you know, and I, and I can show something like that. That's not the case. But I do think, nevertheless, that beauty uh, and related terms, uh, the, 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 the terms of aesthetic judgment are terms that affect us and that we shape together as a community. And if you look at all the times that artists have faced political uh, suppression or oppression from their governments, uh, or look at the times that, uh, that music has shaped the way that we live our lives. I mean, look at the fact that, you know, look at the, the most recent uh, Nobel uh, Prize in literature, for instance you can see that even if we don't agree entirely on who deserves that prize, that, uh, that most of us can look at that and say, oh, I, I think I see what they were going for there. Most of us can look at Homer and say, eh, even if Homer isn't written in a style where I'd want to listen to that all the time, I don't necessarily want it on my phone, so I'm listening to somebody chanting thousands of lines of Greek poetry. Nevertheless, there's something going on in there there's something just very right, those opening lines, sing, O goddess, of the rage of Achilles. Yeah, I know that rage. So I'm not sure if I've given a very good answer to your question, but do you, do you wanna? No, no, of course I understand. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good answer. Thank you. Okay, well, if, if, if you think of another one later, you know how it is, you always walk away and you go, actually, no, I should have said this. Grab me later and, and we, we can talk. How are we doing for time? Do we have, we have time for another yeah, question? Maybe one or two. Yeah, please. Uh, you, in your talk, you outlined three forms of relativism. That's kind of just what you touched on. Uh, do you think, is it possible to hold a position, be an absolutist, yet, uh, in a sense, kind of give in to one of those forms? For example, say, I believe that there is an absolute moral truth, I believe that there is an epistemic truth, but I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Is that a moral contra, or is that a logical contradiction can I be an absolutist yet still claim to not, or still claim to kind of give in to one of those relativist positions you have? Um, no, I don't think that, that's, uh, that, that, that there's anything wrong with doing that. In fact, this passage right up here from, uh, from Plato, once again, uh, Socrates doesn't claim to have the right answer. I do not claim that my argument is right in all respects. 
but I do claim that we'll be better off if we try to find out what we don't know. So he's, he's making a stance about a, an objective position. Uh, I, I usually use the word objective rather than absolute, but, uh, but if you feel free to, to use the word absolute. But he's making a stance about what he takes to be an objective position. He thinks other people should agree with him, that it's better to live a life of striving after the good things than to give up on it. But he also recognizes that he might be wrong. And as we saw in that, the, the passage from Peirce, that the true spirit of Socrates longs to be proven wrong. If somebody can show me that I'm mistaken, that's great because they, they haven't deprived me of anything but a tiny little bit of my ego and a lot of my error. Totally worth the price. But have I gotten at your question? Again, feel free, any of you, to grab me afterwards and tell me if I've missed something. Uh, last question here. Okay. Uh, should we abjectly trust our moral intuitions, or should we develop an error theory? I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Should we abjectly trust our moral intuitions, or should we develop an error theory? Uh, I guess Mark's asking, uh, how can we know that how can we know that our moral opinions or like moral intuitions are based and like empirical, or not empirical, are based like, how can we like, how can we like actually like justify those claims in the absence of moral authority? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, the short answer, uh, I think, um, I'll, I'll turn to Charles Peirce for this, um, fallibilism and a sense of community. So fallibilism is this idea that I know that I'm going to be wrong. So that no, if, I, if I nurture that within myself, th this belief that I'm going to make mistakes, that allows me to hold positions and to even to try to advance them but with the hope that somebody will come along and show me where they have gone wrong. To go along with that then, I need to have a strong community of inquiry around me. People that I trust uh, to do the same kind of inquiry and people that I trust to remind me that I am often wrong. So, can you trust your moral intuitions? In a sense, you have to, right? You, you have moral intuitions all the time and there are so many moral judgments and so many epistemic judgments that we have to make, we often wind up making them quite quickly without doing a long, rational process of thinking through them. But taking time, aside from the busyness of life, to practice making those judgments with other people who will call us out when there's nothing at stake other than exercise. In other words, doing philosophy with other people. That's the sort of thing that builds up the, if you will, the intellectual muscle to allow us to make those decisions more readily when the time comes. Now, I said before that I thought that racism uh, is often a logical fallacy. The logical fallacy, there are many things uh, that, that can lead to racism, but oftentimes I think what happens is somebody has an experience of some person and then somebody else who looks like or seems like that person, and then they make a judgment based on, an entire, uh, uh, on, on a very small group about the entire class. So if you meet, uh, I'll point to myself, I might have an Irish last name. So if you, you meet one Irish person and he seems just completely hopeless, not very helpful in anything, and then you meet another one and he also seems completely hopeless and not helpful in anything, you might be tempted to make a judgment about all people with Irish last names that we're, we're going to be a total mess. <laughs> to some degree, there is reason in that decision. The reason is inductive, though. That is to say, the more experiences you have that line up with one another, the more correct you are in guessing about the likelihood of the next outcome. But the logical fallacy that often leads to racism is mistaking an inductive chain of reasoning, several experiences, for a deductive chain of reasoning. Because deduction, like what we studied in geometry, leads to certainty. So when you mistake a guess for certainty, then you've committed a logical fallacy. And again, I think what we need is lots of opportunities to practice this kind of thinking, not to, to practice the kind of thinking that leads to racism, but to practice the kind of thinking where we examine our own beliefs and the beliefs of others in a friendly community where people are willing to not just pummel us when they think that we're wrong, but that they're willing to correct us because they want to see us flourish and we want to see them flourish. Yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's give Dr. O'Hara a round of applause. For